was almost killed in a car accident like mummy was and nobody took any notice of that they just scared that I'd been out drinking all night with a with a lady of the night and I wasn't she wasn't a lady of the night she was just a girl who liked to take a shirt off sometimes Good morning, how are you? I'm so glad you're back at the channel. I'm so glad you're here for another episode of I'll Spare You the Details. And I just wanted to say, before we ever like do one word about the book, um, thank you so much for subscribing. This past weekend, the channel hit a thousand. And so of course that means that I can be monetized soon. And I really, really, really appreciate everything that you all who are super faithful and super, super, super supportive have done to make this channel grow so quickly. Um, several people have even said, hey, I'm sharing your stuff on Twitter. Um, I hope that I can bring you in some more subscribers. And I just thought that was really, really thoughtful. Very grateful for that. Because the thing is, is that I have a lot, <laughs> we all have a lot to do. So I'm, I'm really busy, you guys. We're all really busy, but I just don't have the time to maintain an Instagram. And a also I was on Twitter for like five seconds and I was like, this place is crazy. And I just could not deal with the uh, hellscape that that place is. So I got out of there real quick. And um, anyway, so I just don't have time. I'm not Facebook. That's a dying platform if you ask me. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter. But I just figured, look, if these videos are good, they'll speak for themselves. People will share them. People will like them. And I don't need to go and plaster myself all over social media and make myself an absolute pariah and annoy everybody to death with my face. So we have so much to get into today. Let's stop this business talk. Um, I have to say, you guys, I have to say it. If you are watching this video and if you are enjoying these videos and if you've watched all the clips and you wa you're watching the shorts and you're invested in these long episodes, but haven't subscribed, consider subscribing because the more this channel grows, then um, the more time I can invest in the channel and the more content I can make. Okay. All that uh, stuff is done. I hate all that talk. It has to be done, but I hate it so much. Okay, spare me the details. Here we go. This section of the book, I was really relieved to get to something that was less whiny. So there's the character of Harry, the public character of Harry, but then there's a real person behind all of these stories and all of the laughs we're getting out of him. And there has to be some kernels of truth in there. And there has to be some kind of revelation about not the character of Harry, of Prince Harry, but the actual human being who felt the need to pen this book. Now, much has been made about the fact that, oh, it was a ghostwriter and lots of theories saying, oh, I don't even think it was a ghostwriter. I think it was Megan. Um, and I do think that there's probably some truth there because this is a very feminine style of writing. There are parts of it that feel like they were definitely written by a man. But then there's other parts, like different asides and different emotional outbursts that just don't feel like that would have been a male point of view to such an extent that he felt he had to include it in the memoir of his life. It's very, it feels very much like um, a woman was behind it. I don't say that stereotypically, but I mean, that's just the way it is. I think men are, I think are in their writing. Um, and I think Harry would be specifically a little bit more clipped and um, uh, abbreviated in, in the way that they express how something felt emotionally for them. Whereas there's just these long passages and these, these sort of uh, a lot of petty indignation um, that doesn't always feel super masculine. Uh, there's one line we're going to talk about today that really illustrates what I'm trying to say. Um, so uh, st stay tuned for that. But in this section, we're talking about his gap year. We're talking about um, the time he spent in Australia, then he went to Africa. We're going to talk about people in his life that he met. We're going to continue to talk about the fact that the press is hounding him and that they're ruining everything. Um, but we also get into the, uh, the the part of his life when he met Chelsea. And we all remember Chelsea. She was this adorable blonde that he had been dating for a long time, I feel like. Um, I mean, I don't know, it's all, I'm not, I'm not like an avid Harry, like I haven't watched every step of his life. I did watch every step of William's life. 
you know, reading about Chelsea and reading about what it was that he found so alluring about her and so different and so um, consuming was that she really had no interest in the fact that he was a prince. That meant ne next to nothing to her. She cared about him as a person. She didn't know anything about his family. And, you know, she'd grown up in South Africa. She had a big life of her own. She just didn't need, she didn't need what he was selling. You know, it, she liked him for him. Which, and we'll talk about this more, but that's the same line that Megan tried on us. I didn't know anything about him. I mean, I, I didn't have, I had, I wouldn't even share who he was. I mean, lo and behold, he was a prince and gosh, you saw that coming. <laughs> Certainly not me. So it just feels like she knew exactly what he, what Megan knew exactly what he wanted to hear. And as we read about his meeting Chelsea, we realized that that meant so much to him. Now, I don't know if Megan had ever heard that that's why he liked Chelsea. I don't know if she just being very astute and able to read somebody's weakness saw that to pretend that she wasn't attracted to him because of his connection would be her in with him. I don't know. I mean, I think that she, for, for her many flaws, Megan has, I think, initially a really uh, sophisticated way of attaching herself to people and, and getting in where she wants to go and making things happen for herself. Now, I think that she tends to implode once she's there, but the she knows how to get an in. So I don't know if she, again, I don't know if she knew that this was something that meant something to him or if it's just, of course, nobody wants to be known in love for their family. They want to be loved for themselves. So maybe that doesn't take that much of a sophistication to figure that one out. Okay, let's get into it. He goes off to Australia and Marco had arranged for him to go and be with his mother's former roommate. She, her name is Annie. Her husband's name is Noel. And they, uh, they have a cattle ranch in Australia. So he goes to be a jackaroo. <laughs> He's gonna go be a cowboy. And he and the oldest son of Annie and Noel are like put together and the, this guy's name is George and George is his mentor. George is like, he thought Marco was awesome. George has just risen to new heights. <laughs> And you'll see throughout this whole portion that Harry is just desperate for an identity. And in George, George is not looking for an identity. George knows 100% who he is. And so Harry and George are put together. They, they work all day long in the broiling heat. Like Harry is completely beaten down by the Australian heat in the outback. It's just almost more than he can bear. So he throws himself into work and they work from like, hours before dawn until dusk. They're like passed out by 8.30 at night. They're so tired, but he loves the work. He loves the daily grind. He loves having something to do. He loves that he's alone. Like he's just way out in the middle of nowhere with George and George's family, but there's no paparazzi. There's no one coming after him. There's no one detailing everything he does. He does still obviously have his bodyguards out there. Poor guys are like out in a hut, just sweltering throughout the day. Um, and so he likes it because he can pretend for a little while that he's just a completely normal person. Nobody knows where he is. Um, nobody is treating him any differently. He is just one of the guys on the ranch. Super fulfilling for him. Unfortunately, real life continues to come knocking. And at one point while he's out there, he gets, he, he continues to get mail and packages from the from the palace, um, paperwork, information about the charities he's involved in. But then one day he gets a letter, a letter from Pa. And what does the letter say? The letter says that Mummy's butler has written a tell-all book. Well, this is bad news because Mummy's butler was supposed to be a friend. How treacherous of him. And listen to what Harry says about this particular memoir. See if it sounds familiar to you. Mummy's former butler had penned a tell-all which actually told nothing. It was merely one man's 
self-justifying, self-centered version of events. My mother once called this butler a dear friend, trusted him implicitly. We did too. Now this. He was milking her disappearance for money. Hypocrisy seems to be a special vice of his. What are the chances that he should describe himself while talking about the butler's book? I mean, isn't that just the irony of ironies that he would say that about somebody else's book in the memoir in which he is throwing everybody he's ever known and loved under the bus? It just is just crazy. Um, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this this passage is he talks about how George, he doesn't say he was obsessed with George, but the way he talks about George is as though he was looking to George to um, transform his personality. Like Harry walks into every situation like a lump of clay and then he waits for other people to mold him. And George happens to be the one in his vicinity that he likes the best. So he is turning into George. And he says here, there were no days off between the relentless work, the relentless heat, the relentless cows. I could feel myself being whittled down lighter each morning by a kilo, quieter by a few dozen words. And this is the part that I'm like, I don't know. Even my British accent was being pared away. After six weeks, I sounded nothing like Willie and Pa. I sounded more like George. Well, six weeks is not, I could spend six weeks in England and I wouldn't walk away with a British accent. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, maybe you do have a different accent, but by choice, nobody's accent changes in six weeks. You know what I'm saying? I just think that he's looking constantly for who do I be? Oh, you're really cool. I'll be you. So anyway, he, that, uh, he's, he couldn't be happier in Australia, but then trouble comes calling. Who should be sneaking up on the farm but the paparazzi? <laughs> and the first day, the first guy that showed up, they captured him and threw him out. But Harry says, I knew there'd be more. They're like ants. You see one of them, there's more coming. And there were more coming. So he decided to pack up, go home, and that would be that you know his time here was done it'd been cut short by the evil press once again they're always just driving him out of the places he loves driving him out with spirits pitchfork all he wanted to do all he wanted to do was to go be a cowboy a jackaroo and even that was taken from him even that so he goes home well he's home he decides that he's really gonna hit the party scene because no one knows he's home everyone thinks he's on his gap year and everybody thinks he's still in australia so he's gonna use this as a time to just party like an animal and while he's out he happens to meet a girl not chelsea unfortunately yo when we get to chelsea all i can think is why didn't that work out <laughs> i'm so sad that didn't work out but anyway this is not chelsea that he meets but he says this listen carefully friends one night I met a girl, chatted with her over drinks. I didn't know she was a page three girl. That was the accepted, misogynistic, objectifying term for young topless girl featured each day on page three of Rupert Murdoch's The Sun. We know what a page three girl is. You know what I'm saying? Like, what is this talking down to me, this woke talk? Like, you don't need to come to me and explain to me about the objectifying, misogynistic, condescending term that is used for a girl who splashes herself across the pages without a shirt on. I know what that term means. You don't need to like explain it to me. And I think that that is what I'm talking about when I say this isn't a masculine book. A man wouldn't write that. He would just say she was a page three girl. Fully well knowing that we already know what that means. But that is such a insertion of the Markle into this book. Maybe Harry did write that, but what I'm saying is he just, he needs to constantly be shown who to be. So like in our example about George, he was becoming George. He wore the cowboy hat, he was changing his accent, he was wearing different clothes. He wanted to be this really cool guy from the Outback. <laughs>
Then he meets Megan and Megan does the same thing with him. Megan says, this is what we think. This is what we do. These are the words we use. These are the words we don't use. And this is why we don't. Enough years of that. And we get a sentence like this. Page three girl was the accepted misogynistic objectifying term of a young topless girl. That's not what a man would say. So I'm just saying, I feel sorry for Harry because he is just so incapable of deciding who he is. And if he had spent enough time sorting out who he was and sorting out what he wanted to be in life and not taking on the title of spare and not taking on um, people's unkind words and not taking on um, the mantle of other people's impressions of him and not constantly looking for who's the coolest person in the room that I can mimic. Where was his sense of self? He had none. So anyway, I, that, that line was just so typical of what I think is happening here. Just, he, this is not his book. This is somebody else's rendition of what his life was. Um, but anyway, he goes on to say that he was seeing the girl and then, um, that night when he left the bar, uh, or the club or wherever he was, the paparazzi starts running after him and he's almost in a terrible accident. Like they jumped the curb in, in the car trying to get around him and take pictures. Like it was like this whole terrible thing. But the next day, the story that was being run wasn't about the fact that he was almost killed in a car accident. The next story, the next day, the story was all about how he was seen with this shady girl and you know, couldn't he do better? And why is he throwing his life away? And why is he always partying all the time? And what's wrong? And what's happening to our prince? And wh what in the world is Harry doing with his life? And he was super offended because he was like, you know, I was almost killed in a car accident like mommy was and nobody took any notice of that. They just scared that I'd been out drinking all night with a, with a lady of the night. And I wasn't. She wasn't a lady of the night. She was just a girl who liked to take a shirt off sometimes. So um, he decides, you know, forget this. I thought I could have a little bit of fun here in, in London, but I guess I can't. I guess everything I want to do is just going to be ruined by the press. They ruined my time in Australia and they ruined my time with the page three girl. And now I guess I just better go to Africa and help the kids with AIDS. So he had planned on taking his friend Henner's, but we remember that Henner's died in a car accident last time we talked. So um, now he's going to ask George. Not surprisingly. And George goes and he says that um, Lesotho, where he had been planning on spending the second half of his gap year was a gorgeous place, but it was also a really terribly tragic place because the AIDS epidemic had just ravaged the, the country and that there was all these orphans and there was all this need and there was all this poverty. And so he just threw himself into the work and he and George from dawn till dark were um, building schools and working um, relentlessly. He says, George and I signed up to help at several charities and schools. We were both bowled over by the lovely people we met, their resilience, their grace, their courage and good cheer in the face of so much suffering. Imagine if he'd learned a lesson. We worked as hard as we'd worked on his farm, gladly and eagerly. We built schools, we repaired schools, we mixed gravel, poured cement, whatever was needed. So he sees the value of hard work and you're just like, congratulations, maybe this is who you can be. Maybe you can work really hard at your charities. Um, and you're hopeful for him, you know? Could he be turning a, a new leaf? Could he be seeing that helping others and not constantly obsessing about yourself and your image is the way to live life? You can think for, if you want to find people that hate you, you will find them. You don't have to be famous for that. If you want to be discouraged by people's opinion of you, you can be very easily discouraged. There will always be somebody out there who can't wait to tell you how much you suck. But why live your life by that person? That person is over there basing their life on what you're doing. You don't worry about that. You go do your own thing. So anyway, he says that in the spirit of service, he had decided he's gonna take it upon himself and he's gonna do an interview. Yes, an interview. He was gonna give the press what they wanted, but it was all for the people of Lesotho. And so he thought he could maybe shed some light on this crisis and use his status to their good. So he goes, he's sitting on this hilltop with this reporter. But not surprisingly, this little interview goes downhill real quick. And he says that he was talking about how he loved the children and the guy said, oh yeah, well, why do you love the children so much? And Harry didn't really know how to answer that. And so trying to be funny, he's like, I don't know, I guess because I'm immature too, so I can relate to them. Well, that was like chumming the waters. The sharks began to circle. And he says that 
Um, then they wanted to talk about, uh, your mother loved children too. Uh, do you think about her a lot? And so then he was like already like, oh my gosh, I don't want to talk about this. Why are you guys always bringing her up? We want to talk about the children with AIDS. We don't want to talk about mummy. And he's offended for the people's behalf that the interviewer isn't taking more notice of the crisis right down the mountain. Why in the world are they wanting to talk to Princess Diana's son about her death? Why aren't they covering the crisis? Then the guy wanted to talk about the fact that there had been some recordings that had come out since his mother's death and they were sort of like confessional tapes and he wanted to get Harry's take on it. Well, Harry inarticulately was trying to express, isn't it too bad that somebody dies and we're all still obsessed with the trauma and trouble that she was having during her life? Like, cannot we let this woman rest in peace? And so he said that, you know, it was just a shame that the press was always feeding this r rabid crowd of people who just couldn't get enough. And the whole thing didn't come off the way he had hoped that it would. Like all his words he, it were, were just spun, it spun right out of his mouth, probably by that campaign spin doctor. And he says that it just was supposed to be this positive thing. And of course they just, it was like pearls before swine is what this was. This was just throwing his pearls before swine. These people didn't care. They were gonna twist everything he said. They were going to turn every question into something he didn't wanna talk about. And basically it was just a giant waste of time. And he tried to, you know, out of the, out of the generosity of his, of his goodwill, throw these people a bone with an interview and then they just wrecked it. They just wrecked it like they always do. Why was he even trying to have any sort of relationship with these rabid animals? And then of course they wanna be like, so tell us about this page three girl. What's going on there, Harry? Love lives, troubles in paradise? And then he was all like, then I just saw red. How dare they talk about her like that? He says this thing that I, I, I just, I couldn't quite sort what he was talking about. He said that the reporter referenced his most recent scandal, which was, of course, the girl that he had been seen with. And Harry writes, he mentioned that some were wondering if I'd really learned something from my visit to the rehab clinic. Had I truly converted? I don't remember if he used that word converted, but at least one paper had. Did Harry need to be converted? Harry the heretic? I could barely make out the reporter through the sudden red mist. How are we even talking about this? I blurted something about, out about not being normal which caused the reporter's mouth to fall open. Here we go. He was getting his headline, his news fix, where his eyes rolling up into his head, and I was supposed to be the addict? I explained what I meant by normal. I didn't lead a normal life, because I couldn't lead one. Even my father reminded me that unfortunately, Willie and I won't be normal. I told the reporter that no one but Willie understood that it, what it was like to live in this surreal fishbowl, in which normal events were treated as abnormal, and the abnormal was routinely normalized. But I didn't know why we weren't talking about all the poverty, disease, and orphans, and death. And then he says that he just felt ashamed sitting there with the journalist, sitting above all that misery and talking about page three girls. Okay. First of all, that, that section that I just read, I don't get. Because he was just mad in the last bit, that on the last video, he was mad because he said that, do we recall? Rehabber kooks. The... Um, journalist whose real name is Rebecca Brooks, that she had written that he'd been sent to rehab. And he was like, that was totally and categorically untrue. And now he's talking about how another reporter is coming to him saying he went to rehab. Okay, well, if it's not true, why don't you correct the record? Why? I don't understand why in this portion of the book, he acts as a, like, yeah, I was at rehab, but what's that to him? Okay, was rehab or kooks onto something or was she not? I don't understand. I don't understand how he can just brush over this and it's nothing. Were you in a rehab? Was rehab or kooks really the kooky one? This, this, this book doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, he starts to feel really bad because he's like, here I was trying to bring attention to the needy and they just want to talk about stuff that is pithy and of no value. Um, I think we can all agree that that's unfortunate. It is unfortunate that we would rather read about Harry's experience with the page three girl and we're less concerned about the orphans. That is unfortunate. But at the same time, this he had to have known that when the reporter gets to sit down with you and the first exclusive that anybody's ever gotten, you think he's not going to try to get a few sentences about something that he knows will sell papers? That's his job. So you had you the fact that he went into that like with 
He acts like no one prepped him for what this would be like. I find that completely disingenuous. How in the world would the palace send him to his first interview and not have somebody sit down with him and say, Harry, they're going to talk to you about this, this, and this. You need to make sure that you have answers for that. How are you going to talk about it when they bring up the page three girl? How are you going to talk? What are you going to do when they ask you about these recordings that are coming out from your mom? They will ask you about these things. These are the answers. If you don't have answers, we will provide them. But you cannot, I, I, I do not believe it for a second that he never got any counsel as to what to say. I think maybe he didn't remember what he was supposed to say in the moment when they asked the question. But for him to act like I just went into it and that was plowed over and nobody tried to help me. And I couldn't believe that I wasn't able to steer the conversation back to what I wanted to talk about. This was just such an unfair miscarriage of justice. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And I'm trying really, really hard this time to be understanding. I really am. But then passages like this make it so hard to be. Um, okay, so then he says that he got done with that interview and he just felt so just torn to pieces about how it went that he went and smoked a shopping bag full of weed. I mean, that's, isn't that what you do when you feel a little down? And then he said, I mean, I think it was that night. I don't know, it might have been another night. Kind of did it a lot. But he didn't have any problems. Nah, nah, he's good, he's good. He's straight, y'all don't have to worry about that. He's good, just smoking a shopping bag full of weed as one does. Anyway, so then he says that, you know, they kind of just needed a break, so they decided to fly out to Cape, Cape Town and they decided to see what was going on over there and they wanted to have a, a dinner and like have some fun. But problem is, I don't know anybody in Cape Town, so how are you gonna have a party when you don't know anybody? So then he says, um, you know, I remember well, I met this girl one time and she was from South Africa. Maybe she wants to come hang out. He'd met her when he was in England and she went to a boarding school. And so he thought that this would be a great time to meet back up with her. So he looks on his phone, he's still got her number and he gives her a call. And she's like, who's this? You know, um, totally thought it was a prank. Marco gets on the phone. No, no, this is really Prince Harry. So she is like, okay. And he says, well, would you like to come and have dinner with us? Me and my friend George, Marco, um, Loki, it's not a big deal. And she's like, okay, I bring my brother and my best friend. And Harry's like, yes, the more the merrier. Bring them on, let's go, let's have a party. And so she comes, her, her best friend, her brother, they have a great night. And he says that he remembered when he met her that she'd been kind of different. He keeps using this word different. She was different, she was different, she was different. And when he met her again, different. And he goes on to describe what different means. He says, unlike so many people I knew, she seemed wholly unconcerned with appearances, with propriety, with royalty. Unlike so many girls I'd met, she wasn't visibly fitting herself for a crown the moment she shook my hand. She seemed immune to that common affliction sometimes called throne syndrome. It was similar to the effects that actors and musicians have on people, except with actors and musicians, the root cause is talent, and I had no talent. So I've been told again and again. And thus all reactions to me had nothing to do with me. They were done to my family, my title, and consequently they always embarrassed me because they were so unearned. I'd always wanted to know what it might be like to meet a woman and not have her eyes widen at the mention of my title, but instead to widen them myself, using my mind and my heart. With Chelsea, that seemed a real possibility. Not only was she uninterested in my title, she seemed bored by it. Oh, you're a prince? Yawn. So he's bowled over by the fact that she's not bowled over. And as we said in the beginning, Meghan Markle also used this tactic. Now, I think Chelsea was genuine. And we know Chelsea was genuine because she walked away from it. And we'll get there later. But the whole thing, the paparazzi and all that, she did not love that but pretend to hate it. We all know Megan loves it and pretends to hate it. She loves it. Loves it with her very heart, soul, and mind. But Chelsea really was, I think, as genuine as she could possibly have been. And I think that, I mean, she was, it wasn't like some Cinderella story where he picked up some girl who had no idea about wealth and privilege. She was doing pretty well. Her, their family was doing fine for themselves. So she didn't need Harry's money. You know, I think that sometimes we, we look at, say, like, you know, these, these girls that are brought into the family, um, Catherine, who I adore. I mean, with, I just think that Princess Catherine is the epitome of all that is classy and elegant and wonderful. Um, 
people, but people act like, oh, that was a Cinderella story. No, it wasn't. I mean, her family was doing just fine financially, you know? And so, I mean, of course they weren't like royalty by any means, but you know, it's not like he just picked up this girl from the streets of Africa. She didn't need his money. She didn't need his fame. Her family was well to do. She'd been sent to boarding schools in England. She was the upper class herself. But even so, the status of Harry meant next to nothing to her. And he was really drawn to that. And wouldn't anyone? I think I would be. I think that that would be such a relief to finally be around somebody who wasn't trying to get close to me to use me. The sad thing is, is that the very thing he wanted, he has now fallen straight into the jaws of somebody who could want nothing more than to use his fame and titles and, um, and family status and political position for herself. And I think that it is really, really sad because here's the thing, person doesn't have to be intellectually a genius and they don't to, to get through the world. There's plenty of people who, you know, didn't go to Harvard who are just killing it at life because they know how the world works. But I think that unfortunately for Harry, not only does he lack uh, intellectual prowess, I think he's also really struggling with common sense and emotional maturity. And so it's like, He's 0 for 3. He doesn't have the emotional maturity to figure out what to do. He doesn't necessarily have the common sense to be able to figure things out. I think he's incredibly impulsive. And I, then I think he does also struggle intellectually. Um, and so, you, I mean, a person has to be pretty hard-hearted to look at somebody like that and say, oh, you buffoon, what's wrong with you? I mean, I I think that he does things that are just unkind and and. I mean, the story about Pat and, and stuff like that, that he has told, like he continues to tell on himself and it's like, okay, well, you don't have to be brilliant, um, emotionally mature and uh, with a little common sense. Like you should know just as a, a, on gut level as a human that you don't mock somebody who is physically disabled. You know, so I'm not giving him a free pass here, but what I am saying is I think he's very depleted in the things that would make one successful. And so when a Meghan Markle comes into his life, I mean, he was just... I mean, I was like, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, her work was cut out for her. Anyway, so he meets Chelsea, loves Chelsea. Loves Chelsea, thinks she's great. He's not ready for the night to end. And he tells her, look, we are going to go and um, we're gonna meet some people. We're gonna go float up this river. You wanna come with us? And she's like, mm, I don't know, me and my friend have some plans. And he's like, oh, too bad. Mm. And she's like, oh, but I can change them. So she changes her plans. I mean, who didn't see that coming, come on. So, changes his plans. They spend three days walking, laughing, drinking, mingling with the wild animals. And he says later that night, they <clears throat> had their first kiss. George is meanwhile falling in love with her best friend. It's all just this lovely romantic African adventure. It's, I mean, it's like a movie. And then it's time for everyone to go their separate ways. Chelsea's gotta go home, the girlfriend's gotta go home. Marco's gotta go back to London. George has to go back to Australia. It's the parting of the ways and everybody is just beaten down with the sadness of it. Well done! Uh. Well said! Well done! Um, and then he says that um, while they were out there, he's with his friend Addie. I'm not entirely sure who that person is, but I guess his guide. And, um, and I think his, it was his guide from a previous trip, if I'm remembering correctly. But anyway, Addie's there guiding him through the jungle. And while they're there, they find out that there are these filmmakers um, in Africa. So the filmmakers are um, having this big party and Harry sort of stumbles on the party and he introduces himself. And the um, filmmakers are this husband and wife team. Um, her name is Tej, his name is Mike. And he gets to know them and they sort of like, Hmm. take them take him under their arm he says that he like he'd love to see them um like he'd love to be on set with them and and they they're like making films about the animals in Africa and he wants to like be helpful and and at first they're a little bit like you know you're gonna have to work out here okay no one's like going to cater to you there's things that have to be done so if you want to come with us that's fine but you have to come with us in the knowledge that you'll be expected to be part of the crew and do stuff to help this you know, we can't work around you. And he's like, no, 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 I'm, 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 I actually want to help. Like, I'm good at hard work. I, I can do hard work. And so they're like, okay. And he can, I mean, he's proven himself thus far if what he says to us is true. 
Um, and so he says that he tagged along and he loved the whole film making thing, but then he was also super in love with the story of Tiege and Mike. The story of how they met and the story of like how much they loved each other and like just watching them in action together. All he could think of was how um, admirable their relationship was and, and enviable. And I mean, this couple was gold and he just really, really wanted to be in their sphere as if something of their love would rub off on him. And also he talks about the fact that he says that they saw in him this sort of wildness that couldn't be tamed. And he said that they didn't want to tame it. Unlike everybody else who was always trying to just squash him with their boot. These people saw in him his wildness and, 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 and his um, childlike innocence. And instead of trying to kill it, they fostered it. So again, Harry likes anybody who shows any kind of interest in him, which don't we all, but he's obsessed with people liking him. And so if people like him, he's immediately, he's all in for that. If you show any kind of kindness to him, he will be loyal to you till the end. Even if like you show for years that you should, that you have not earned his loyalty, he will continue to be loyal to you. The Meghan Markle inst instant, I mean, the fact that he has remained so loyal and so steadfast to Megan, who to the rest of us is an abomination, is exactly the illustration that I need. He, he once he decides that you are a person that cares at all about him, even if that love starts to diminish or starts to tarnish, he's still going to be replaying the episodes of when it was great. And he's still going to be like, how can we get back to that time together? Anyway, he loves Tish and Mike and he, and, and he just loves being in the um, sphere of their romance and he just feels like they are, they are the people that he wishes that he was. He also is obsessed with Africa, like obsessed with Africa. And I think it's because maybe that's when he first felt all that camaraderie on that one trip that he took, but he just feels like Africa is the only place where he can feel alive. And Tish tells him one, one night when they're sitting around the campfire, um, which he says like the campfire had always been a place where people gathered. But for Tish and Mike, it was like, um, the, for, for Tish and Mike, the fire was sacrosanct. The drinks went round, the same riveting stories, but it felt more ritualistic. So, I mean, he's just sort of like building these people up in an odd way. Like he can't ever define for me what he means by like what it is about th about them that he thinks is so wonderful. But anyway, she says that, um, she says to him during one of these ritualistic campfire meetings that um, she says, I think your body was born in Britain, but your soul was born here in Africa. And he writes, possibly this was the highest compliment anyone had ever paid me. I don't get why that would be that big of a deal. For somebody who's constantly scrambling around for words of affirmation, I don't get why this was it for him. But anyway, it was. Then he, after being around their, you know, in their love nest for so long, he decides that he really needs to go find Chelsea. He needs Chelsea. He needs her. And so he's like, how do I get to her without the paparazzi finding out about it? About it? And Addie's like, get in the car and drive. I feel like he's supposed to be doing charity work, but he seems to like do a lot of whatever. And that's kind of something that I don't necessarily get about a lot that Harry talks about because, you know, he just writes these asides like, you know, I was over there laboring from dawn till dark. But then when he tells me about what he's really doing, like hanging out with the filmmakers and floating down the river for three days and partying in Cape Town and, you know, jumping in the car and driving two days to go find Chelsea, it's like, how much work were you actually doing? I'm not saying you weren't doing some work at the schools, but like how much, like what are the percentages here? Anyway, he jumps in the car and again, one of these statements that he says, is like, what are you talking about? He says, like in the, in, a, in the same vein as I went and smoked a bag full of, a shopping bag full of weed. He says that he gets in the car, starts driving with Addie. He says it was only two days after all of driving. We jumped into the car, drove without stopping, drinking whiskey and gobbling chocolate for energy. I arrived at Chelsea's front door, barefoot, scruffy, crowned with a filthy beanie, a huge smile creasing my dirty face. She gasped, then laughed, and then opened the door a bit wider. Okay, it's all very romantic, but what about the part where you're drinking whiskey for two days straight, driving a car? You know what I'm saying? Like, he just will throw these things in, and I'm just like, are you trying to be relatable? Because I've never driven for two days and drank whiskey and ate chocolate 
on my way to go meet somebody. I've never been like, oh man, I'm down. Shopping bag full of weed, where'd I put that? Like, these aren't the actions of a normal person. And yet he wants to be like, I was just a normal guy and nobody understood me. And everyone was trying to make out that I was like this idiot and this, this, this slob. Blah, 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 blah. But it's like, okay, you'll go, you'll go on for paragraphs where you're normal and then you'll just throw this in. Paragraph, like, oh, we were just normal kids playing, but we also threw fireworks down the well at somebody. Somebody fell in a well and I threw fireworks on top of his head. You know, we're just going along, skimming along. Everything's just normal. Everything's fine. Except I was doing cocaine. I'm skimming along. Everything's going fine. I'm not doing anything I shouldn't be. Except I was doing an old lady in the backfield. Everything's fine. Except for the shopping bag full of weed. And drinking whiskey for two days while I was driving. These, these like little flashes of examples of your behavior, they don't lend in my heart a feeling of, oh, everything's good with you. It was everybody else's misunderstanding. You keep confirming our you, you keep confirming our suspicions that you were not necessarily living a life that was full of great decision making. Anyway, um, then he talks about bringing Chelsea back to England. He wanted people to meet her and he wanted to bring her home with him. But of course, when they got there, it was just they were just attacked by the paparazzi. And Chelsea was taken aback by it. And he says that he reassured her, oh, you'll get used to it, you'll get used to it. So it's not a big deal. <laughs> like, you can't let this kind of stuff bother you. It's like, okay, well, why don't you look in the mirror and tell yourself that same line? And she just was like, I don't know if this is something I necessarily want to handle all the time, you know? It just wasn't something that, she didn't feel special by it. It didn't make her feel seen and, um, important it was just whoa this is a huge hassle and kind of scary and I don't know if I'm down for this and then um she she spent time with him she goes back home and and he was kind of worried because he's like you know if now that she's experienced what life with me will really be like I guess you know, like I'm hopeful that she's not out but I don't know I, I mean I just don't know but he kind of leaves us hanging there just a little bit. And then he starts talking about the fact that he's got to take his entrance exams into Santos Military Academy because it's time for him to get real about his army career. Remember, he's just on a gap year and that's coming to a close. And now he's got to get real and take these exams. And he says that they were great for him because they didn't require any, he didn't have to have no book learning. Didn't have to have no book learning. And he said that the exams were four days um, and there was some book work, there was some written stuff, but mostly there were just psychological tests and leadership skills. And he had those in spades. <laughs> and I'm like, who was doing your psychological testing? Because hey, you shouldn't have passed that. But he does, he does say something that made me laugh because I do know this to be true. He says, the army was looking for lads like me. What's that you say, young man? Parents divorced, mom's dead, unresolved grief or psychological trauma? Step this way. Um, my husband was in the military for years and I can tell you that they prey on people who are desperately looking for a place to find home. Um, it's just a very easy demographic of people to bring in and show them the way because they need a way. And he's not wrong about that, like at all, that his sort of um, mental, his mental state is exactly what they would want. Cause they'll show you want a, you want a personality you want something to do you need to figure out what to do with yourself step this way because we want to strip you of everything you've ever known we want to strip you of your identity we want to strip you of your personality and we want to replace that with our own set of ideals our own personality our own. and i and i'm not saying this at all in a cynical way a military has to be has to be run that way it can't be a trove of people with individual personalities. It has to be people who can follow orders, has to be people who know that this is the way it has to be done. It has to be a, a, it has to be almost like a cult in order to get everybody doing what they need to do in order for the objective to be realized. So I'm not saying that it as any stab to the military, but what I'm saying is he's not wrong. He is exactly the candidate that they would want. And so for once, everything that he is, is exactly what it needs to be. Um, but we end this with he 
did so of course he does fine on the uh he passes he passes just fine and then he's like all right well before i i go off and he sort of tie up loose ends last time he calls chelsea chills last time chels was with me i'm just not sure if she was okay with be, what what being with me will look like and so he calls her and um he's like you know what are you thinking about me is everything still okay and she's like yeah it's fine and before you go to school why don't you come back to cape town i'd really like you to meet my mom and dad so he meets them and he writes this and he says about his about her parents they were impossible not to like they enjoyed funny stories gin and tonics good food stocking her father was bear-sized broad-shouldered cuddly but also a definite alpha her mother was petite an amazing listener and a frequent bestower of epic hugs i didn't know what the future held I didn't want to put any carts before any horses, but I thought if you designed in-laws from the ground up, you couldn't do much better than these guys. <laughs> and then he had to go off and marry Meghan Markle. Oh man. Like literally I wrote down in the margin. Why couldn't this have worked? It just makes you really sad because I think, I truly think she's the one that got away. I really do. And I hate the fact that like now he's married to somebody who doesn't even know her dad, whose mom is always up in the house, but I don't know how positive that is. Um, He's married to somebody who does not have family ties and bonds, which he clearly really, really, really idolizes the idea of a strong family unit. And he's not finding that with Megan. And he's, I don't know how, I mean, she's not helping him build strong family bonds. She's not helping him um, re-energize those places in his family where he felt um, they could have used some shoring up. She's not coming in as anything other than as an agent of destruction. And you have to just believe that Chelsea would have been so much better for him because she was not bowled over by everything that he had or that was, was in his life. She wasn't looking to change him or make him into what she thought would be an even better version and I'm really eager to hear about why they didn't work out from his perspective. Um, but it's just, a, it's such a shame. It's such a shame to me as I read this that I just wonder like who he would have been had he met somebody and married, if he had met Chelsea, married Chelsea, like what could her family have been to him? What guiding wisdom could her dad have, like what guiding wisdom could her dad have, have given to Harry? Like another strong male who could have helped shape him in positive ways. But instead now he just thinks that he's caught up in a world in which whiner, whiners win. Whinging is the way to get what you want. Complaining constantly that nobody understands you. And always acting like a victim. And it's not becoming on a woman and it's less becoming on a man. So I think that, man, I wish, I wish things had worked out with Chelsea. That's all I kept thinking was I wish things had worked out with Chelsea but they didn't. And we'll go on to find out what, what finally happens with them and what goes on with his military career in the next segment, which comes out Tuesday. But I'm going to end this now. This was a really long video, but thanks for watching. Bye.